All right, if you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to Zechariah chapter 13? Got two more chapters to go. We've got this week and we've got next week. And, and these are the best news in all of this. Today, we're going to be talking about a purified possession. We're going to be talking about how it is that God is going to purify. And Christ himself will do this. Imagine for yourself, there is a, a new movie that's coming out. Maybe it's the next Mission Impossible and you don't really know what it'll be like, but you get a sneak preview with these trailers that come out. And everybody wonders, well, well, how good will it really be? How good will it be? And you don't really know for sure until you've actually seen the movie itself for yourself. Well, that's the way it is in the movie industry, but that is not the way it is in Zechariah. That's not how it works. Throughout the book, God has given us his plan of what will happen. In chapters 1 through 6, he's given us eight visions. Visions of God's promises to Israel and promises to the nations and promises about the Messiah, what he is like, who he is. And he has given us these four discourses in chapters 7 and 8, where he tells us that God will be faithful. And there is a call to man to be faithful in those chapters. God says to man, your worship, is your worship for me? Is it unto me? Or is your worship for you and unto you? When you fast, is it for you or is it for me? Chapters 9 through 14, we have these two oracles, these two burdens. And the first one covers the time of the Gentiles. This is the time of military warriors like Alexander the Great who conquer the world. It's the time when Jesus comes and conquers sin. And then he is betrayed by his betrayer, Judas. And then he goes to the cross and he's crucified by his own people, and later, at the very end of the time of the Gentiles, the Antichrist is going to come and, and carry out atrocities against God's people. Starting in chapter 12, we have the time of the Jews. It's the time when Christ himself returns. Israel is saved physically. We saw that last week. They're also saved spiritually. And that is a wonderful thing. And all of that is what it is. But here in chapter 13, God is going to tell us exactly what it's going to be like. In other words, how good it really, really will be. And we don't have to wait to get there to find out because God shows us right here in the pages of his scripture. And what chapter 13 shows us is that the unfolding of Christ as Messiah produces two things. It shows two things. First, it shows us a purified land, and then it shows us a purified people. So we're going to see a purified land in verses 1 through 6. What we want to do is explain why purification is necessary. Before we go ahead and read the passage, it's important for us to understand why purification is very important. So what we're going to do is we're going to go back to Leviticus chapter 19, looking at verses 2 and 4. Let's turn there. God's command there in, in Leviticus 19 is that they be holy. Let me read this. Speak to all the congregation of the sons of Israel and say to them, you shall be holy for I, Yahweh, your God, am holy. Do not turn to idols or make for yourself molten gods. I am Yahweh, your God. I am your God. A big part of Israel's holiness is their singular devotion to God. There shall be no idols. Now, we know that Israel ran after other idols. They, they ran after idols in Egypt, and they brought those idols with them through the wilderness into the promised land. Solomon's wives, Solomon's wives turned his heart away from God to the idols. The kings of the northern kingdom, they embraced all of the gods, the Ashtoreth and the Molech and everybody else, and their hearts were turned away. But we saw in the last chapter, in chapter 12, that, that God actually solved the problem. He removed their hard hearts. In verse 10, I will pour out on the house of David the spirit of grace and of supplication. That's the regeneration that's taking place there. But the idolatry didn't just have a polluting effect on the people themselves. The idolatry had a polluting effect on the land itself. Listen to these words from Jeremiah 16, just one verse. Verse 18. This is what Judah's idolatry did to the land. They have profaned my land. They have filled my inheritance with the carcasses of their detestable idols and with their abominations. So Israel profaned not only themselves, but they profaned and they polluted God's land. But if Israel was going to dwell in God's land with God as his people in the millennial kingdom, then that land needs to meet God's standards of purity. Purity 
And so the land itself needs to be purified. Even though Israel will be a redeemed people, they themselves won't actually be able to purify the land. God needs to do it. And verses 1 through 6 show us how God is going to do that. So let's read those verses together back in chapter 13 of Zechariah. Verses 1 through 6. In that day, a fountain will be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for impurity. And it will be in that day, declares Yahweh of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols from the land and they will no longer be remembered. And I will also cause the prophets and the unclean spirits to pass away from the land. And it will be that if anyone still prophesies, then his father and mother who gave birth to him will say to him, you shall not live. For you have spoken falsely in the name of Yahweh, and his father and mother who gave birth to him will pierce him through when he prophesies. And it will be in that day that the prophets will each be ashamed of his vision when he prophesies, and they will not put on a hairy mantle in order to deceive, but he will say, I am not a prophet, I am a cultivator of the ground, for a man sold me as a slave in my youth. And one will say to him, what are these wounds struck here between your arms? Then he will say, those with which I was struck in the house of my friends. What we're going to see here in the first part of this chapter in verses 1 and 2 is actually God's promise to purify the land. God says, in that day, that's how he starts out. This takes us back to chapter 12. It's the battle of Armageddon. It's the same time frame. It's beginning with that battle, and it's going to be continuing on. So we're looking at a, a short period of time that God is describing here. And God makes mention of a fountain. A fountain here is not speaking of stagnant water. We know what a fountain is. It it describes moving water, rushing water, fresh water, lots of it. Think of fresh, clean mountain spring water that is cleaning a dirty bowl. That's what God has in mind here. God is saying Israel will be engulfed with the purifying work of Christ. And God is saying that that fountain will be opened. There's a start but it's, it's an ongoing activity that's going to be taking place here. God is saying, I'm going to begin a cleansing process, and that process will continue. And that fountain will be open specifically for two things, and the first of those things is sin. And when God is speaking of sin here, he's speaking of Israel's departure from his perfect standard. It's a measure of the degree to which they've departed from his perfect law. God is saying, I'm going to open this fountain for that, because you have fallen short of my sin. So this fountain removes Israel's sin problem before him. But he also opens this fountain for impurity. And impurity is is really a little bit different. God has something different in mind here. And he's speaking about uncleanness. He's speaking about the fact that Israel is no longer presentable before him. They're disqualified from their fellowship before him. And so this fountain removes not only their sin, but their uncleanness before him. Think about what we have back in chapter 12, verse 10, where God said that he had poured out or he will pour out his spirit of grace. That's his favor to save. And he will pour out his spirit of supplication. That is his favor to sanctify. But Israel was still unclean before God. So God is saying, I am going to do everything that is necessary to make you acceptable before me. I have saved you. Now I am going to cleanse you. But God is going to do more than that. And we see that in verse 2. God says, in that day, and so we're we're looking at the same time frame here. It's a period of time at the very end of the seven-year tribulation. God says, I will cut off the nations, sorry, the names of the idols from the land. So Israel has been summoned to the promised land from the corners of the earth. And there may already have been idols in the land, but they certainly brought their own idols with them. They are an unbelieving people when God summons them back to the land. God says, I'm going to cut them off. The Hebrew word there is really, really clear. It's talking about an expunging, just a complete removal of something as if it was never there. He says, I'm going to cut off the names of the idol. Every single one of these idols, each of them is a particular offense against God because it occupies a space in the Jewish heart that God intended only for him. It occupies that space where God intended them to put their trust and their affections, and their devotion, and their confidence. That was where they were supposed to place God, but what they did was they placed idols there instead. So these are an offense against God because they have taken the place in the Jewish heart that he and he himself deserves. And God says they will no longer be remembered. 
I'm not only going to expunge them as if they were never here. No one will ever have any memory of them. I'm going to remove any trace of them as if they were never here. God is a jealous, jealous God. Let's remind ourselves of what what God told Israel in the first giving and in the second giving of the Ten Commandments. He says, you shall not make for yourself an idol. You shall not worship them for I am a jealous God. This is so important for us to understand because it helps us understand the reason why God is going to do this. God is saying, I'm going to enumerate each and every one of these idols and I am going to obliterate them from this land. Even their names will be forgotten. Israel, I'm going to do this because you belong to me. I have made you mine. You are rightfully mine. I'm going to cleanse this land and I'm going to cleanse you. So God is going to to cleanse the, the idols and he's going to remove them. He's also going to remove these false prophets. And we see those in verse two as well. I will cause the false prophets and the unclean spirits to pass away from the land. I'm sorry. He says, I will cause the prophets and the unclean spirits to pass away from the land. When he says the prophets, he's referring to the false prophets themselves. And the unclean spirits are the spirits that are behind those messages. It's the demonic entities that are behind those messages. The false prophets are the men who pretended to speak for God. They pretended to speak messages from God. They pretended to speak messages on God's authority. But they really actually spoke a demonic message that was not from God. God says, you're going to pass away. I will cause you to pass away from the land. That's to get rid of and to banish. Again, it's a permanent removal. No sign of them again. So God promises to cleanse the land. And then he goes on to show us what this will really look like. And this is really, really good for us to look at. And this is going to be the result of this. And that's in verses three through six. So God makes this promise and then he gives us the result. We don't have to wait to see what it'll be like because God tells us right here what it will be like. But as we look at this, we need to look through verses three through six again. And we notice the references to the one who prophesies. We see it in verse three. If anyone still prophesies, then later at the end of the verse, when he prophesies, and in verse four, the prophets will each be ashamed of his vision when he prophesies. And this is an area of great disagreement in the commentaries. You can find everything you want to find here, all kinds of positions. There's a hypothetical position of what could possibly take place. There's some commentaries that indicate that what is taking place here is that uh, is being spoken of a different time frame. And there's other commentaries that speak to that there actually is going to be prophecy in the land. I think what we do know is what God has said here. He said, I will cause prophets and unclean spirits to pass away from the land. And so when you step back and you you look at the millennial kingdom, the prophets and the unclean spirits are not going to be there. And verse one talks about a fountain that is going to be opened. It implies that there's a cleansing and a cleansing takes place over a period of time probably a very short period of time. And this is probably the period in which the prophets are decidedly being removed from the land. There are a couple of passages that help us understand this. Let's go to Revelation chapter 20. We'll get there on Sunday mornings here in a few months, probably, but let's take a look at verses one through three. What we're going to see here is the removal of influence during this very same time. This is the New Testament perspective on this very, very same interval of time that we're looking at here. John is writing again to seven churches. He's writing and he's talking about a time at the very end of the seven year tribulation at the beginning of Christ's millennial reign. As I read this, just be thinking about the influence of Satan. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven and having the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan and bound him for a thousand years. And he threw him into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were finished. So this angel is operating as God's agent. He's coming down from heaven. He has authority over the entry and the exit into the abyss because he holds the key to it. He is using this great chain to subdue Satan. And he binds him for a thousand years and he throws him into that abyss and he shuts it and he seals it over him. So he is removing Satan's presence from the earth. But we see the reason why he's doing that. 
so that he would not deceive the nations until the thousand years are completed. He's removing Satan's influence from the earth. And what that means is there will be no false messages on the earth. There will be no false prophets on the earth in the millennial kingdom. The conclusion here is that because Satan is bound in the millennial kingdom, there really will be no false prophets there. So when we go back to our passage in Zechariah, we can understand that there really will be no false prophets. Now let's turn to Joel 2.28, and we're going to see here that there will be prophecy in the land, but it will be prophecy of a different type. This just helps us understand that we're dealing here with with false prophets that, that is being spoken of. Joel is speaking, and he's speaking again of this very same time. He's going to mention afterwards here at the very beginning of this message. And what this is after is the after is after the battle of Armageddon. It's after the, the killing of all of the people in the nations. It's after the restoration of the land. God says, and it will be afterwards that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Even your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on the male slaves and female slaves, I will in those days pour out my spirit. So God says, I'll pour out my spirit on mankind. And the Hebrew here is really clear. It's literally, it's talking about flesh, Jewish flesh. God will pour out his spirit on the Jews. And that's what we see in Zechariah 12, verse 10. When God says, I will pour out on the house of David, my spirit of grace and supplication. That's the very same thing that's being described here. And the result of this, we see as we continue to read in verse 28, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Old men will dream dreams and young men will see visions. All of this, the prophesying, the dreaming of dreams, the seeing of these visions, this is a manifestation of the Holy Spirit, the spirit of grace and supplication that is poured out. And what this is not is extra biblical revelation that is coming to these Jewish people. It's not what you see in other belief systems in this world where there is, there is one person who has exclusive communication with God and, and he reveals that. No, the canon of scripture is closed. What this is, is biblical revelation. It's the evidence that God actually has been faithful to his promise. It's the evidence that God has poured out his spirit of supplication on Israel. Judah says, God, show me more of your truth. And so God answers that request. When God pours out his spirit of supplication, it is the spirit that enables Judah to say, God, give me more. And God answers by giving them more. That is what these dreams and these visions are. It's the truth that they've ignored for so long. What is not going on here is spiritual chaos because God is a God of order. 1 Corinthians 14, God is not a God of confusion, but he is a God of peace. So every Jew in the millennial kingdom will be an agent of God's divine revelation. This is not new revelation because again, the canon of scripture is closed. What this is, is revelation that the Jew has rejected throughout their history. So in Old Testament Israel, the prophet spoke in the Old Testament and he spoke words of God to the people. And these were corrective words. These were, these were rebuking words. These were words that were condemning to the people because of their indifference towards God. And no Jew had the spirit of God within them, really. But now every Jew is indwelt by the spirit of God and they're receiving truth from God. And so the key here is that in the millennial kingdom, there will be no need for a prophetic order. There will be no need for anyone to call themselves a prophet because everybody will understand God's truth. So what God is saying in verses three to six is, I have brought this prophetic order to an end. And there will be no special class of men who deliver truth to you because you will all know this truth. And this is the kind of people you will be before me. And verses three through six describe the particular kind of people that they will be. First here in verse three, we're going to see that the Jew will be a zealous people for God. Let me read the verse again. It will be that if anyone still prophesies, then his father and mother who gave birth to him will say to him, you shall not live for you have spoken falsely in the name of Yahweh. And his father and his mother who gave birth to him will pierce him through when he prophesies. So it's very likely speaking of the very end of the tribulation period when there are still false prophets in the land. God has poured out his spirit on the chosen ones. 
And he's speaking of the father and the mother here. This is the redeemed Jew who has an allegiance to God that is stronger than any family bond. These people will say, you have spoken falsely. They will be able to say that because they will know that what he is speaking does not accord with the truth that they now understand, but the understanding that they've received from God. They'll pierce him through when he prophesies. They're going to be so zealous for the Lord that they will actually be God's agent in exterminating these false prophets. So they'll be a zealous people. But in addition to that, these people are going to be a discerning people. Verses four through six. It will be in that day that the prophets will each be ashamed of his vision when he prophesies. And he will not put on a hairy mantle in order to deceive. But he will say, I am not a prophet. I'm a cultivator of the ground for a man sold me as a slave in my youth. And one will say to him, what are these wounds struck here between your arms? And he will say, those with which I was struck in the house of my friends. So he's going to be ashamed of his vision. There's a good analogy that helps us to understand this. Imagine that a salesman comes to your door and he is attempting to sell you a product. And that product is inferior to the product that you already have. And he knows it and you know it. And he's really going to be ashamed of his message, of his pitch. Uh, the same thing is going on here. The, the false prophet is so ashamed of his false message when he looks around and he sees all of the people that are embracing the truth and he's seeing the obvious evidence of their love for God and the change of life that's in them. He will not put on a hairy mantle. What that means is that he's not actually going to do anything to try and gain any credibility as a prophet in the people's eyes. In the Old Testament days, when there was a false prophet, he would garb himself. He would clothe himself just like the prophets would so that he would gain credibility and he would like to be seen as one who was one of the true prophets. They would try to look like Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Isaiah, but he will be so ashamed of his inferior message that he'll say, I'm not a prophet. He'll actually try to disguise his identity. But look at the discernment of the Jewish people here. They say, well, what about these wounds? They, they cannot miss the telltale sounds, signs on his body. These wounds are, are wounds of self-harm that was inflicted on his body. It was highly esteemed among false prophets to harm your body, bring, bring cutting and slicing to your body. 1 Kings 18, 28. This is when Elijah and the prophets of Baal were, were together in a showdown. And they were not able to, their gods were not able to bring down fire on the sacrifices. Look at what they did. They cried out with a loud voice and they gashed themselves according to their custom. It was held in very high esteem to, to gash yourself and cut yourself. So the Jews are discerning. They see these cuts, they see these marks and they question it. The Jew knows their history and upon seeing these wounds, they know that this is a false prophet. And then look at his answer. This is one of the most lame excuses we will ever see. Well, I got these in the house of my friends. He doesn't even know what to say. So he makes up something that, that doesn't rhyme. It doesn't make sense. There, there's no validity to it whatsoever. Think back to the end of chapter 12. Israel will look on Messiah whom they have pierced and they will mourn for him. Messiah Jesus is exalted as Israel dismisses these false prophets and they embrace him as the true shepherd. The bottom line is that God has promised he will cleanse the land and he's given a picture of this in a very zealous and a very discerning people. So that's the picture. We can look at this and we can know exactly what it's going to be like. We're not going to wonder. There will be these people who are full of zeal and full of discernment in the promised land. We don't have to wait to see um, it will be as if we're already there. We know exactly what it's going to be like. They will know truth from falsehood very, very clearly. So the unfolding of Christ as Messiah produces a purified land, but it also produces, secondly, a purified people. And we're going to see that in verses 7 through 9. Two time frames are in view as we look at this. We want to keep in mind the fact that in verse 7, the time frame that's in view here is the earthly ministry of Jesus. A time of his earthly ministry when he came and was walking on the earth with his disciples. Verses 7 and 8 are going to take us back to the time that's at the very end of the tribulation and the beginning of the millennial kingdom. Let's read the whole passage, 7 through 9. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man my associate, declares Yahweh of hosts. 
Strike the shepherd that the sheep may be scattered, and I will turn my hand against the little ones, and it will be in all the land, declares Yahweh, that two parts in it will be cut off and breathe their last, but the third will be left in it. And I will bring the third part through the fire and refine them as silver is refined and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name and I will answer them. I will say they are my people and they will say Yahweh is my God. God is speaking of a spiritual cleansing here, but he wants Israel to fully comprehend how it is that that cleansing is going to come about. God will purify his people first through a necessary sacrifice. And let's take a look at that sacrifice in verse 7. And notice that the father himself is speaking here. And we also want to notice that there is a, a very complete gospel here as we see this. Lots of pieces of the gospel are present in, in verse 7. And first we see divine wrath. Awake, O sword. We know what a sword is. It's, it's an instrument of wrath. And God wants Israel to understand that his wrath must be satisfied if they are going to be cleansed. So they need to know that there is a sword in view because God has wrath in response against sin. But that wrath is going to be against the shepherd. And this is where we see the imputation of sin. This is the only way that God's sword could be against Christ is if Christ actually bore in his own body what was most offensive to God. And that is Israel's sin, by extension, our sin today. In order to be working for Israel to save them, God had to be working against Christ. And then you see substitutionary atonement when he says against the man. Jesus is able to represent sinful man before a holy God because he's actually one of us. He is fully man. He was born of a woman just like the rest of us are. So God is saying, I'm going to give you a man. He is going to represent you before me, but he's also my associate. The Hebrew word here helps us understand that this is one of the strongest statements of the deity of Christ that you will see in your Old Testament. The word associate, God is saying to Israel, Jesus has fellowship with me. He has equality with me. He has identity with me. He is on the same mission I am on. We are one on this mission. It is essential that Jesus have the capacity of God in order to satisfy the wrath of God. Any other way, any other person, any other being could not satisfy the wrath of God that God has ready to pour out. So he says, strike the shepherd. The substitute would actually sustain a lethal and fatal blow to himself. And that's true because our New Testament tells us in Hebrew 9 that without the shedding of blood, there will be no remission. There will be no forgiveness of sin. So he says, strike the shepherd that the sheep may be scattered and I will turn my hand against the little ones. And now this is moving on from the time of the crucifixion, beginning the church age. This is in all in God's plan. It's the dispersion of the church in the first century. This is what you see at the beginning, the very beginning in Acts 8, where the stoning of Stephen and then the Jews after that are dispersed. So God's want those Jews who were coming out of the tribulation and entering the millennial kingdom to understand the cost of their salvation. The Messiah must actually give his own life. To this point, they've seen the Messiah as the one who's going to come in and save them. He's going to rescue them from all of these armies. And that is true. But they need to understand that this Messiah is the one who's going to give his life to save them. We ask ourselves, well, for whom is he, he giving his life to save? And this is possibly one of the most important questions in all of human history. Not only will God purify his people through a necessary sacrifice, but he will purify his people through a necessary selection. And we see that in verses eight and nine. And here time again is advancing from the earthly ministry of Christ and it's moving forward to the end of the tribulation and the beginning of the millennial kingdom. And he says, and it will be in all the land in the same way that the false prophets and the idols are purged from the land. God's saving work will permeate the land. God is going to do a saving work in, in the promised land that, that covers all areas of the promised land. There will be no part of the promised land that is excluded from God's saving hand. Go back to chapter 10. We're going to look at verse 8 for a minute. And we're going to see how it is that God actually gets the people into the promised land. It's not too far back. We can remember this a few weeks ago. He says, I will whistle for them and gather them together, for I've redeemed them together 
and they will be as numerous as they were before. God is actually whistling for Israel. He is summoning them. It sounds really, really good, but for the Jew, again, this is some of the most sobering words they will ever hear. God has sovereignly brought all of Israel back to the promised land, and his reason for doing that is so that he can divide them. Two parts in it will be cut off and breathe their last. The word cut off there is a a very sudden, violent death. It's a very quick death. The life of the Jew will end very suddenly at the end of the trib. Two parts of them. They will breathe their last. He's speaking about a, a termination of life. This refers to the killing of Jews during the tribulation. Let's think about the tribulation. Matthew chapter 24, I want to read a couple of verses from Matthew chapter 24. We're going to look at verses 16, 19, and 21. What we're going to have in view here is that the Jews in the promised land are going to be facing great hostility against them. Those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Matthew 24, 16. Verse 19 Woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies. Verse 21, for then there will be a great tribulation such as not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. God is saying that during that time of tribulation, there will be a great deal of suffering by the Jewish people. Then there's the battle of Armageddon itself. Let's go back to Zechariah. And we're going to have a rest for our fingers after this. Uh, Zechariah chapter 14, verse 2. We'll get there next week, but we're going to get an advanced look at it so that we can understand how it is that God is actually selecting his people. Indeed, I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city will be captured and the houses plundered, the women ravished. Half the city will go forth in exile, but those left of the people will not be cut off from the city. So there there is great death among the people of Israel. So he mentions two parts, two parts in three. There's two parts and then there's a third part. Two thirds of all of the Jews will die in unbelief during this time. And what's really sobering for us is that is twice as many people as God will save. Everybody that was returned into the promised land, everybody that was whistled and summoned back is sinful and idolatrous and the rebels against God, every single one of them. So they all deserved God's wrath and God gave to two thirds of them the just penalty of their sin. Think about that for a second. All of the promises for the Jew and the millennial kingdom were not for those two thirds. Not all Israel is Israel, but the third will be left in it. This is God's final remnant. These are the ones that will receive new life. These are the ones that God will pour out his spirit on, his spirit of grace and his spirit of supplication. And we ask ourselves, well, why would, why would God do that? Why would God whistle all of these people back and then save one third of them? And the answer is in verse nine, I will bring the third part through the fire. God will preserve his remnant through the tribulation and through the battle of Armageddon. He will sovereignly sustain them until the appearing of the Messiah Jesus at Armageddon. And he will refine them as silver is refined. This is where we see why he's going to do that. The intense heat of the refining fire removes the impurities of sin. We know that. When heat is applied, the impurities are removed. So when the heat of Armageddon is applied, the impurity of their sin is removed. God says, I'll test them as gold is tested. The trial doesn't just remove sin, it has ongoing benefits. What it actually does here is it authenticates what has actually taken place. It authenticates the person as one who actually does belong to Christ. The trial is so bad that anybody must be, anybody who survives must be a follower of Christ. And we say to ourselves, well, why is this necessary? We remember that none of them were without sin. None of them were qualified for fellowship with God. None of them were qualified for fellowship with Christ. Any that would be in fellowship with God in the millennial kingdom had to be chosen away from the end that they would deserve. And that's why there's a necessary selection because all of them deserve banishment from God. All of them deserve death. So if any of them are going to be with God, he will choose them. He must choose them. And look at the result of the choice that we see. This is the evidence that God actually saved them. They will call on my name. 
each and every Jew. This is a wholesale nationwide calling upon God of everyone who's left, something that was never seen before. And God says, I will answer them. On many occasions in Israel's history, they called out to God. They called to God, but he did not answer them. And here he does. In the past, when they would call out to God and God would not answer them, it was because of an ongoing pattern of sin in their life. Here, there had been an ongoing pattern of sin, not only for generations, but for centuries. But God in his kindness answers here and he answers permanently. The testing and refining that has taken place will have the intended effect. It will be a restored relationship between God and his people. And they will prove that by saying, God will say, they are my people. God is affirming right here his covenant relationship with his people. He is saying, these are people that are unique to me. These are people that I have chosen. These are people that I have called and they are mine. And this is what God has been aiming at since he called Abraham out of the land of Ur way back in Genesis 12. This is what he has been aiming at, a wholesale salvation of the people that God wants to bring to himself. So God says, they are my people, and they say, Yahweh is my God. In one sense, it's a corporate statement because all of Israel is doing this. But notice the personal nature of this. Each one of them says, Yahweh is my God. They know it's true that Yahweh is our God as a a country and as a people, but every one of them proves that they have been chosen by God and changed by God because they say, Yahweh is my God. So that's what happens when God purifies his people, Israel. He declares them to be his own and they declare that they belong to him. So stepping back, these are the details of what it is for Christ to rule in the land. You have a purified land and you have a purified people. We don't have to wait to to imagine what it will be like. God tells us right here, here is exactly what it's going to look like in the promised land. I'm going to be full of people who have a a zeal for me, full of a discerning people who, who know the truth from the enemy. Satan himself is going to be removed. There will be no influence. It is a very, very clear picture. So let's look at a couple of different points of application for us as we look at this. First point of application Evaluate your zeal to live a pure life. Is it motivated by a love for Christ? Do you have a zeal to live for Christ that is motivated by a love for him? Do you desire to strive after holiness of life and purity of life because of a love for Christ and what it is that he has done for you? Secondly, express your gratitude to God for his gracious choice. Think about God's selection of Israel here at the end of this passage. Thanksgiving is one of the most effective ways to keep your own salvation fresh in your mind. If you've known the Lord for any period of time, you you know that you need to be reminded again and again and again of just exactly what it is that he did for you. And a regular pattern of thanksgiving before God is good for that effect and that end. Read Ephesians chapter 2, 1 through 3 regularly to remind yourself of the extent of God's grace towards you. Let's pray. Father, thank you that your word is so clear, that it is so authoritative. Lord, your word is true and you've given it to us. And you've given us the picture of who your son is and what it will be like in the land that he rules over and reigns over. I pray for us, Lord, as we live here in this day and this time, that you would grant us your grace to run hard after holiness of life out of love for Christ. That you would make us a discerning people, Lord, a people who know the truth from the lie because we read your word. Lord God, I pray that we would be a people who are always soft to the gospel because of a thankfulness in our heart towards you. So grant us your grace this week to go from this place and to live that way. And I pray it in Christ's name. Amen.